Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com. Uh, if you're an entrepreneur and you want to be around other top performers to solve big challenges, and form deep friendships, this is for you. It's a group of top entrepreneurs that come together to solve your their biggest and your biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Rise25 is run by myself, John Corcoran. Check it out at rise25.com. It's an application only since we keep it to a very small group. And I want to give a shout out, thank you to Shane Stott for introducing my guest today. Um, today we have Brian Oaks, he's founder of Global Goods, where they source and manufacture agave nectar, coconut oil, and Mexican vanilla products. They produce their own natural skincare line, Cacave, C-O-C-A-V-E. They sell all over the world. And what's interesting, Brian, is you do this by also providing local jobs to struggling areas like in Africa, Asia, Domin- you know, Dominican Republic, and many more. Thank you for joining me, first of all. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. You know, I wanted to talk about some of the big challenges and mistakes, um, but I have to ask about the struggling nation. You know, setting this up, this does not seem like an easy thing. And I was reading on your site, um, tell me about the first time, I think you went to Africa first, right? No, I actually went to Mexico first. Oh, Mexico. Yep, I mean I, setting up the I mean setting up the struggling nations for your oh uh, yeah your business yeah so uh, yeah Africa and the coconut oil project was one of the first ones so when you went to Africa I know I know we'll get into you know the Mexican vanilla was first then we'll talk about the agave and the coconut yeah. oil and cacave line but talk about when you first went to Africa and what it was like well I first started going there uh, as kind of a humanitarian project where I was trying to build schools, libraries, wells, water cisterns, things like that. And, uh, you know, it's funny on the second, second night there, we had a Cobra come slithering right into, I would have taken the next flight home. Oh yeah. I was like, Oh, I'm going to die before we ever get off the ground here. (laughs) It was in your room. Uh, well, we were staying in, in I, I mean, if you call it a room, it had, uh, we had concrete walls and no door and, and uh, that type of stuff. So anyways, they, um, it was, a, it was a, you know, a, an open area, I guess. We were still working on construction for it. And so that, uh, that gave us a pretty good scare right off the bat. Wow. So what do you do when a cobra is in your room? I mean, do you just leave yeah, well, well you know we we scream like a bunch of little girls and then uh, <laughs> there was a there was a native who came running in with a bow and arrow and he shot it and really? it was yeah so we we were in like camping chairs and so we kicked these camping chairs around and we're kind of using it to try and guard or guide this snake i mean i didn't know what kind of snake it was until i bumped it and i was trying to knock him towards the door oh and he reared up and i realized it was a cobra at that point and oh, uh oh my god uh, I, I'm not sure. I may have wet my pants at that point. But that, <laughs> I'm wetting my pants listening to the story. <laughs> and so a native comes running in with a bow and arrow and shoots he it. He actually and shot it. Takes the head off and as it's moving, all this stuff. And wow. I was like, you've got to be kidding me. And, and later I realized that arrow just barely missed me as it went past. You know? And so I was like, I'm not going to survive this. We got a 10 day trip here and I, this is like day two. And, I'm never going to survive it. So anyways, it was, uh, it was a, a rough welcoming there, but, um, Day two, it, right. was, it was, it was a fascinating trip, but you know, we, I started making those type of trips. I, I did my best to donate with some friends of mine to, uh, to, you know, build up these schools and do different things. And I started to recognize, you know, the natives were saying things like, Hey, well, we want a school in our area and we want a school over in our village so that the kids People don't were have- coming from other villages and yeah. Saying that. Yeah, and we got we got to the point where we were educating about three thousand children there, wow. and in the in the whole area, we were the first ones to ever educate somebody to uh, make it onto college, 
And uh, we had three young men that made it on to uh, be able to go to Nairobi to go to the university there. Wow. And so we were really proud. We had a big celebration for them when they came back after their first semester. And uh, we, you know, it was just everybody was so excited. And then we had just kind of a group of us and those three young men. We had just a little sit down meeting as to how school was going, what they thought about it, and they're loving it. Um, one of the one of the students. This is a neat story, real quick. Yeah. One of the students uh, was being sponsored by a family who had a child who was struggling really badly with diabetes. Yeah. And uh, and so we asked him what was he studying in college, and he said, "I want to find a cure for diabetes." <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> For uh, for the family right. who's sponsoring me to go to college. Wow. And, uh, you know, it's just so many awesome stories like yeah. that. And so, anyways, but they were saying, what do you want us to do with, with the village? What do you want us to do, you know, in this area? And, um, you know, they're like, you know, once we get jobs, do you want us sending money back? And right. I was like, dang, you know, I don't want to... I don't want to just constantly be You want to be self-sustaining. You're an entrepreneur. Yeah, exactly. You want to sustain itself. Exactly. And so, in all honesty, my first attempt was to see if we could grow agave there. <laughs> and uh, How do was, you know? How can you even tell? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, my... my history my education was in uh, graphic design and so i know nothing about planting plants i mean you, know? you just bring a plant with you and plant it there we and see if it works so what did you we do we brought a few and then uh, we had irrigation issues the areas we were in just didn't have a lot of water to work with during certain parts of the year and you know with an agave plant it takes about eight to ten years to grow it to full maturity before wow. you can harvest it and then you have to start all over again and so that was just an enormous project and i realized i wasn't in a position to be able to uh to take that on at that time mm -hmm. and so when i came back home i was showing friends photos from the trip and there's one particular photo where this uh, there's this stream that's kind of running through all these palm trees and stuff and you know without seeing them without being there feeling the heat and the mosquitoes and all that kind of stuff it looks like the most beautiful place in the world and it doesn't look like something you'd picture from Africa you know right. and uh, anyways and I was just sitting there staring at what a beautiful picture that was and then I was thinking about the coconuts how we climbed up we you know I didn't, but uh, somebody was with You're us. like, good luck with that. <laughs> he climbed the tree and grabbed a coconut, and and you know, and so I started thinking about coconuts. So I was like, man, I know there's a lot of stuff that you know people use coconuts for. I watched them use a lot of it there, and so uh, I was like, I wonder if we could turn that into some type of business. And so when I got back home, I started working with a local university. Uh, Brigham Young University. I was working with them to uh, their design department and trying to figure out, or the engineer department, trying to figure out, can we make machines that don't require electricity to be able to harvest something from the coconuts? And so we decided coconut oil was the one that we would try. So we spent a year working on it. We brought these machines back. We tried to so use... So it's a machine that doesn't require electricity. Yes. Yeah. And, so and this so, team of engineers started working on, I mean, where do they even start with that? Well, we had started earlier working on projects where they would make uh, merry-go-rounds that would pump electricity or would generate electricity so they could use the power of the kids playing on these things. And oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Electricity that way. Um, we also had... Um, a teeter totter, I think, yeah, where you rock back and forth, and that would pump a well, and so the kids would sit there and play on that, and oh, then wow. that would start pumping a well. So we had done some fun projects before. It's like child slave labor, but but they're playing. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. If you're gonna play, we're gonna get some fun of it. If we can. <laughs> <laughs> and so, anyways, it turned out to be a lot of fun for everybody, and more of a project of can we do it versus uh, yeah, it's a sustainable. What did project. the final contraption look like? Um, it wasn't very big at all. It was, uh, you know, two people could lift it out of a truck, and it was just a, a small little uh, machine with a grinder on it where it would grind the meat out, and then we would take that meat. Uh, well, and there was also another device where you could uh, crack open the coconuts easily. And so, anyways, you, you crack it open and you grind out the meat as much as you can. Yeah. And then we would put this meat on a drying table and there would be these women just sitting there chopping it all up into little pieces, moving it across in stages. Yeah. And when it gets to the end, the oil's just dripping off the meat. 
and then uh, we put it in this big kind of cylinder press where we got the biggest African we could and he would just pull the handle and it would uh, press it down and we would squeeze out as much oil as we could and then we would take it to another facility where they filter water for drinking and that type of stuff just to make sure there were no bugs or bacteria in the oil that type of thing and then we would bottle it in drums and we put it in 55 gallon drums and the first uh shipment that we did i brought in six 55 gallon drums i was like i don't even know if i can sell this where did stuff, they come where did they come into where do you have them shipping like your house is there like a like a shipping center where where yeah, do they yeah we, we have a warehouse in uh los yeah. angeles where we you're what you're like your wife's like well, what's going on those drums in your kitchen <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> yeah actually yeah no those first ones we brought into we have a detached garage so yeah we brought them into there right. and uh and i i didn't bottle them i didn't know really what i was going to do with these drums and so i just shot off a newsletter saying hey we've got this new product line of coconut oil I don't even know you know I've heard it's good for you but that's you know here's the story behind it and boom within a matter of a couple days all six drums were gone and I really? was like oh, did okay, people buy have- the whole drum like there so, people- yeah so we a lot I mean that's the majority of the the selling that we do now is uh, that's a big really? part of our business is oh just I have no selling- idea yeah and big drums or totes they're they're even larger than that okay and so yeah, so we um, so we sold those drums, and we bottled some of it as well. But we sold everything in just a matter of days, and it takes a, a while to get this production going. So we were out of stock for a long period of time, right. and so we could ramp up. And now we bring in uh, containers full of uh, well. 80, 80 drums at a time wow, and, uh, where we'll crazy. bring them in in totes and and uh, yeah and so it's we're moving we're moving several containers if anyone wants to see the drums you can go to globalgoods.com backslash, backslash products and if you scroll down I'm assuming it's those those big blue drums is that what it is yeah because yeah. I remember seeing this it looks like something that you would store like a huge toxic waste <laughs> like to get rid of as much stuff as possible in these huge <laughs> drums that are tied down. Yeah, so we work we work with a lot of manufacturers, a lot of uh, bakeries and stuff like that. They'll they'll order in okay. larger amounts like that just for discount purposes. Okay. Cool. Well, I'll have to introduce you to Matt Gettys, who I had on before, who they actually have a coconut oil um, company, and oh, so okay. I'll have to introduce you because that may be. I forget it's called Skinny, um, and they they have coconut oil. Um, nice. So, yeah, I've probably mentioned that to Shane at some point, and uh, <laughs> that's probably how you came up. But uh, that's amazing. So you you did all of this without realizing how am I going to sell it? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, and you know, I ran into so many problems doing it. So, for example, uh, they thought well, one of the guys in Africa decided to go to the Philippines to see how they that's, manufactured That's a great coconut. idea, yeah. Yeah, so we're like, awesome, let's do that. So so we sent them there to learn a little bit more about the process, how they did it, and make it a little more, uh, you know, run run everything just a little bit faster and more right. efficient that way. And, uh, and so he came back and he's like, all right, let's try this carbon filtration system. And I was like, sure, whatever, man. <laughs> you know more than I do now, so... Let's let's go with it. So he set up this carbon filtration system and sent me 80 drums where he ran it through the filtration system but did not filter the carbon back out of the oil. And so we we brought in 80 drums of coconut oil that looked more like olive oil. <laughs> it had kind of a, a green tint to it. And I was like, oh, no, that's a big mistake. Like, we can't be making that kind of mistake. So now I had 80 drums that I had to get rid of, and I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. What is and, the, is it a – like, what is – because it was a different um, – is typical filtration, you have to get the carbon out of it? Yeah. So is it yep. bad without – like can you refilter it or what? what is uh, – what's the bad yeah, part if about you, it? If you had, if you had the, the machinery to do it, you could do that. Okay. Um, there wasn't anything bad with the oil per se by itself. It just did not look good. Oh. It did so it was the look looks wise. Like if, you, if someone ate it, it's perfectly yeah. fine. Yeah, you could eat it and you'd be perfectly fine. But uh, in terms of, uh, you know, a lot of our water filtration systems have carbon in them. It reduces the smell. It reduces, you know, other stuff like that. So what would you do with those drums? 
You have 80 well, drums that look yeah, like olive oil. 80 drums, and I'm like, what am I going to do with this? And yeah. so I, I found a company who made lotions, and uh, they said, oh, we don't care what the, what the oil looks like. It's not going to look like that as we put it into our lotions, yeah. so we'll buy it from you. And yeah. they loved it. They thought it was fantastic. <laughs> I was just like, really? And so I was like, huh, lotions. I wonder what you could do with lotions. <laughs> right. <laughs> and so, and uh, you know, it's interesting because I would watch these Africans use the coconut oil on their skin and they would use the coconut oil in their hair. And, uh, you know, and they, they had some fantastic skin. And so um, then on my trips to Mexico and, you know, we were introduced to agave nectar at one point. I, I met this old lady who uses agave on everything wounds, you name really? it, she's using agave on everything. And so she's like, oh, yeah, this stuff's mir miraculous. It'll heal anything, you know. And so I was like, what the? All right, that's fascinating. So anyway, so I um, one day I was just sitting here at my desk, and I was like, I wonder what I could make if I mixed all these things together. And so I mixed the coconut oil, I mixed the agave nectar, I mixed the Mexican vanilla and it and stirred it all up and it smelled really good. It smelled like it'd be a yummy smoothie or something, you know. Right. And, and you I was could like, drink it or put it on your skin, right? Yeah, and I was like, but I you know, I don't know what you would do with this, but it sure does smell good. And and then uh, and then it started to separate on my desk, you know, and this because you have oil and water type things. Right, and, right. And so it sat there for about two months on my desk, and you know, my employees are like, "What are you doing with this?" And I'm like, "I'm just thinking." <laughs> right. And, uh, long story short, I uh, taught myself how to uh, about emulsifiers, how to mix the oil and water together. Um, I took a local class on how to make your own soap. Soaps and, and lotions and stuff like that. And so I went and figured out, okay, this is how it's done. Now let me see if I can make something using the different ingredients that we have. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I started mixing everything together, started making a lotion and came out with something which my wife really, really enjoyed. And uh, That's the true test, she, yeah. Like... She, she's like the most honest person you could ever come across, at least with me. <laughs> and if she doesn't like it, she'll let me know about it. <laughs> and so... So anyway, so we uh, we created this lotion and we designed up some nice packages for it and everything. And we're like, all right, let's send this off to our user base and see what they think of that. And so we we sent some off and the testimonials started coming back in that were just blowing us away. Wow. And, you know, what were people using it for. Well, like like I said in the beginning, I'm a graphic designer, man. I'm not a I'm right. not a food chemist. I don't know anything about lotion. I don't know anything about that. But um, I you know I just told people about the different ingredients and how people use them. Another ingredient that we added to it was coconut water. And during uh, World War II, uh, they ran out of plasma on some of the islands and they started using coconut water as a replacement for plasma. And so, you know, I added that into the product instead of, you know, regular distilled water. And, and um, so I, I started, you know, sending this product off to people. And all of a sudden I start getting these calls from people just saying, you know, I have my, my hands are cracked and bleeding. The only thing that helps them is, you know, uh, this special cream. I wear these gloves for six months out of the year when oh. I sleep at night. Oh. And uh, somebody bought my bought your lotion and gave it to me. And in four days, it cleared it up. Wow. I was like, that's oh. crazy. I was like, okay, well, that's great. You know, sometimes you can believe things like that and it helps you, you know. <laughs> and then... I you were still someone skeptical. Else. After oh, yeah, I was. I really was. And uh, and then someone else uh, called in. They're like, oh, my, my heels are cracked and bleeding and nothing works with them. And I put this lotion on it and three or four days, cleared it right up. And I'm like, serious? I'm like, wow. maybe there's something to this. And then uh, one of the one of the areas that uh, we just started getting more and more comments about was with eczema. And so people are like, the only thing that helps is a steroid shot and a prescription cream when this stuff flares up on my hands or yeah. elbows or whatever. And they said, we put this stuff on it, cleared it right up. And I'm just like, <laughs> wow. you got to be kidding me. What Which one is it? Because there's a bunch of, is it the, the body that's, cream or what is that's it? That's the body cream, yeah. Okay. Because you have yeah. a massage oil, you have a body cream, and then you have some other things yeah. like uh, I noticed like a tea tree oil and other things like that too. Yeah. Yeah, so we've got we've got a lot of different blends of different things that you can add into the products to kind of customize it for yourself. 
Um, another business that I, I started off in the very, very beginning, I, I was a, I taught myself how to develop websites. Yeah. And back in 2001, I developed a website creation tool that allowed people to build websites without really knowing what they were doing. And, um, and I found a niche market with cosmetologists, massage therapists, estheticians, that type of thing. Right. And, uh, and so as I started to develop these products, these lotions and this shampoo and conditioner, I realized, huh, I've got over in this business, I've got all these people that have all these websites. And over in this business, I've got these products that these type of people use. So I've spent the last few years trying to merge those two a little bit and, right. uh, and help each other out. And so I've made, I've made the Kakavi uh, line so that they can customize it. So that if you've got dandruff, you could add a special blend that we have into the shampoo and conditioner that'll help with dandruff. Mm. Or a uh, little, little more potency to the lotion for eczema or for acne and different things like that. So just doing a lot of different things, but just having a ton of fun. <laughs> That's amazing. So tell me about when you first set up the and we'll we'll backtrack and talk about how you got to that point because there were a lot of bumps in the road up until Africa. I mean, it wasn't all, you know, amazing sunshine and everything like that. Oh, yeah. and, and that's one of the reasons you went is because you were at a point in your life that with family and health and business that allowed you to now kind of reach out to others and right. help others. And we'll, right. we'll, we'll get to that point, but I'm curious of what the original setup looked like for the coconut oil in Africa, and now what, it, what does it look like now? Like before it was just like some like lady grinding the coconut and then people yeah. chop, like that's what the original setup was. It was like, right. and it was it in one of these concrete buildings or was it just, yeah. I mean, my brother went and, and uh, went to Africa and he's a dentist and his operating room was in the middle of a field with goats walking around. I mean, so I don't know what to picture for this. Yeah, that's that's pretty close to accurate right there. So we had some different buildings built up. Uh, you know, we have a, a big section that's a couple different schools for different age groups of, of students there. And then we have this main center where we bring you know, friends and, and business partners and stuff into where they all participate and, and we, we split up during the day and we go off into working on different projects so that not all of us are all working on the same thing. And then uh, at night we come together and we talk about all these different things. So now we've got electricity there. Um, we, we actually have a yeah, pretty slow grade of internet there as well <laughs> so we're, we're starting to starting to bring things in from the city and and running them out to there we still don't have paved roads going out there so it's a it's a slow process and a bumpy process getting there but uh we have doors on the on the center now so that we don't no have COVID. snakes rolling in and yeah. mosquitoes are still plentiful so you got to be careful of that but uh but everything else, uh, we're we're starting to get there with it and make it a How little. How often more. do you go over there? Um, you know, it just depends. Depends on the year and the schedule. Um, mm -hmm. Right now, I've got people in place who who do a lot of the effort over there for me, yeah. and so I don't have to go as often as I used to. Um, so I limit it to once or twice a year now. Yeah. So how do you manage it there? What's the staffing look like? Um, we actually have. Altogether, there are about 200 people now who are working, uh, gathering coconuts. I mean, people, we allow people to bring coconuts from anywhere they can find them. And then we will weigh them and uh, measure them and weigh them and pay them accordingly. Uh, wow. That's that, you know, from that. Uh, from those numbers and then uh, so we get people just coming from all over the place that are just trying to make income for the first time in their lives yeah. and we have a, a small staff of about 10 people who are making sure you know that that run everything for us and one of the college students who returned from that original group he is um, he's kind of running the whole facility for oh. us so this sounds like it's a huge undertaking time wise energy wise but money wise so do you have to seek out other like people funding it or can you fund it through the, the current anymore. business? Not anymore. That one was almost self-funding from the very beginning. Really? Wow. Just because of the process and the way that we that we went through it. And we started so small and we grew it at a, at a rate that we could and, and something that our business could handle. And so anyways, it uh, we were able to self-fund that one. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Wow. 
So I'm sure growing up, Brian, you never thought you would have a huge facility in Africa, you know, <laughs> employing 200 people. When you were growing up, what did you want to do? You know, the internet didn't even exist when I was growing up. So, <laughs> in fact, I remember my mother being happy if I became a UPS driver. So, <laughs> there's nothing wrong. Where did with you me. grow up? Did you grow up I, in I grew up Utah? In Detroit. Oh, Detroit. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so, my dad, uh, he worked as a plant manager and used to uh, make sure that all the parts were being assembled properly and stuff on. Uh, you know, Ford, like Ford Jeep, yeah. Chrysler, yeah. yeah. And so he, he worked with a lot of different companies, and we always yeah. kind of struggled financially. Um, I was the type of kid that, you know, my my parent and my mom would always hit every garage sale. We used to make a joke as we were driving, the car just starts pulling towards the garage sale signs when you see it, you know. And, I and like it, garage sales too, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, so that's, I was always that type of kid. I never had a whole lot growing up. And, um, and so anyways, you know, my, my parents taught me from a very young age that, you know, when you decide you want to do something, you go all out and you yeah. go after it. Yeah. Um, real funny story. When I was 10 years old, we moved into the, probably the worst home that I had ever lived in in my life. And, uh, my dad just lost his job. Mm. We were renting this place. And he um, and so I went out to go find some friends one day and I'm just walking down the street. I'm 10 years old. I don't know any better about good kids, bad kids. Everybody's friendly as far as I knew, you know. And, and so I walk over to this one corner and there's all these kids sitting there, you know. And so I was like, I you know I, I rode my bike over there. And uh, so I rode past him and trying to get the courage up to go talk to him, you know. So I turn around and I come back and I'm slowing down like I'm going to talk to him. And one kid gets up and starts running right at me. Scares the heck out of me. So I'm trying to pedal to get away from there. And he grabs my bike and I hop off my bike and just start running home as fast as I can. And wow. he chases me the whole way home. So I get home and I'm just, you know, tears streaming down. I'm huffing and puffing. And, and uh, my dad's sitting in his recliner chair reading his newspaper, probably looking at want ads. I don't know. <laughs> you know? Right. And uh, and I'm, I'm huffing and puffing. I'm like, Dad, you, you got to go help me. These kids just stole my bike. And and uh, I just remember him. He's sitting there reading his paper and he folds it halfway down so I just barely see his eyes. And he goes, son, I got you a baseball bat. Go get your bike back. <laughs> What kind of what kind of advice is that? <laughs> that doesn't seem like your happy go lucky personality, anyways. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. So, uh, but I did. I grabbed my baseball bat. Really? Yeah, and I, I went back over there, and uh, you know, my bike sitting there next to all these kids, and and you know, I'm probably just I got tears probably just streaming down my face. I can't even remember. It was probably a pretty pitiful scene, but I was like, you guys gotta give me my bike back. <laughs> And, you know, funny story, they thought that was pretty cool that I, I came back, that I was willing to, to fight for my bike if I needed to. They would have just beat me to a pulp. But, but anyway, so they <laughs> gave, gave me my bike back. We were all good friends after that. So That's crazy. <laughs> but that's, I mean, that's kind of the, the way that I grew up, you know. And yeah. They didn't fight my battles for me. They, they made me figure it out on my own. And, uh, and so... Anyways, that just kind of transitioned as I as I got older, and it was like there's been tons of battles that I've had to fight in yeah. the business, you yeah. know, just keeping it going, and and uh, tons of battles that you know you fight through life, and uh, you never see things coming, but you know there there's always something, there's always something coming right around the corner. If you can get your bike back at ten, I guess you could set up a facility in Africa. You could do anything, right? <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> So in high school, college, what did you what did you want to do? Um, you know, I had a brother-in-law's brother, so he, he married my sister, and his brother was a graphic designer, yeah. and he used to he used to design the coolest looking packages, and boxes, designs, whatever yeah. it was, and I was like, that's kind of cool. Yeah. I think that's something that I want to do, and so I went to college and I, I learned how to do that. And interesting thing is. I designed some Wolverines for our university. Did you go to where did you go to school? Uh, I actually went to Utah Valley. Oh, you went uh, to Utah Valley. Yeah. So yeah. why Utah Valley coming from Detroit? My brother was living out here, oh. and something about we we had a rough 
rough growing up, you know, and and uh, I think we just wanted to get out of Detroit as fast as we could. So yeah. I kind of skipped a part. My dad actually started his own business, and uh, and you know, the, as with any business, it struggled at first, you know. But then all of a sudden, he designed some parts that you know got put on every Ford Escort the year that the Ford Escort was the wow. number one selling car in the world. And all of a sudden, we went from having nothing to he retired early. And we're like, <laughs> like, wow. how's that possible? You That's know? amazing. And I remember one time he took me to the store to uh, buy some shoes. And he said, you know, it was a buy one, get another pair half off. And I never, ever went shopping with my dad ever. Like, just it never happened. No, no, I don't remember hardly going with my mom either. It was, And so anyways, so I went and picked out a pair of shoes that I could use. And, and he's like, well, why don't you get another pair? You know, it's half off on the other one. I was like, who are you and what would you do with my father? And he's like, no, it's okay. Go ahead. And I'm like, no, I just don't feel comfortable. I don't even know what that's like to, to own two pairs of shoes that I, wow. that I don't yeah. need or whatever. And he pulled me aside and he's like, son, we made enough money this year. It's okay. You can get two pairs of shoes. Wow. <laughs> and so... Anyway, so we uh, so I, I went off to college and um, out there came out to Utah to go to college, and uh, my uh, I was living with my brother at the time, and so I, I had you know some some room to to try some different things, right. and uh, so I. Um, let's see, the first thing I started doing. Well, the first thing I was doing, I took a screen printing class. And I designed some T-shirts with local universities, just different designs. Didn't even know it was illegal to use their right. logo and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but I, I was using uh, my assignments instead of just doing regular assignments. I was using projects that I could print shirts yeah. or sell. So you make some like University of Michigan stuff, like with the Wolverine. Uh, you said I didn't. I didn't do that one. So oh. actually, the school that we were that I was going to, their mascot was a Wolverine. Oh, it was a Wolverine also. Okay. Okay, that's yeah. why I thought you were referring to University yeah. of Michigan. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so uh, I designed a Wolverine for the university, and they paid me nine hundred dollars for it. And I was like, "Dude, I'm set, man." <laughs> that's, that got me through the entire summer without having to pay, you know, having to make money for rent and everything else. It was yeah. ridiculous how cheap things were back then. But uh, right now, that's like a car payment, you know. <laughs> but, yeah. But anyway, so we. Um, um, so I, I designed this Wolverine for the school and they paid me that money. And so I decided, well, if I want to get better at graphic design, I need to go to a graphic design shop and just volunteer yeah. because no one's going to hire me as I'm just starting off in college, you know? Right, right. And so, uh, I went and I, I worked with this one group and all summer long, I just watched their graphic designers. And when I would see them do something, I would move over to my computer that they let me use. And I would try and do the same thing yeah. and just kept doing that all summer long. And then I got back into school and, uh, and we were using the old programs at school, like Adobe Photoshop, Illustrator, those type of things. And I was like, why are we using the old programs when the new versions are out? And the professors are like, they just barely came out with these and we're still trying to figure them out so that we can teach them. And, you know, we'll get to it next semester. And I'm like, ah. Oh. I don't want to go backwards. That year happened to be a really big jump. And so, so I finished that semester out with my associate's degree and I stopped. And I was just like, you know what? I've already surpassed some of these guys. And I talked to the head of the design department one time and I was like, look, I'm doing this logo for somebody and I want to know what should I charge for this? And he's going, Brian, it's been 30 years since I've been in the real world selling stuff and, and doing things like that. And he's like, I don't even know what to charge anymore. So at that point, I just realized, you know what? I've already surpassed what yeah. they're going to be teaching me to a certain degree. Right. You wanted so, the real world experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so what do so, you do? So I, I started up Mighty Oak Design. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, on your on your story page, you say Mighty Oak Design and then in the beginning this is your words, not mine, but uh, you were joking that it's Mighty Broke Design. <laughs> why right. Why'd you use, or who was using that and why? <laughs> I think uh, I think my brother was the one who came up with that one. <laughs> okay. I'm like, we just met, so I would never say that um, <laughs> if no, it were my words. You're fine. It, it was funny. So uh, anyways. We, so you struck my, out on your own. Yeah. Yep. So what did you do to get business? How did you get business? 
Um, you know, I just put out uh, ads in the newspaper, in the phone book, and, uh, and then started learning about the Internet. And one of the challenges I ran into was I was so young, even though at, in, while I was going to college, I actually worked uh, when it wasn't that one summer. I worked at the university in their kind of graphic design, doing the posters and the magazines and stuff like that for the university. Right. And so I learned a lot of stuff about print and how to how to set things up for the printers. Yeah and all that type of stuff but that was a big challenge back in the day yeah. and uh, you mess that up and you know you got to reprint everything and it's real costly and so um, a lot of people didn't want to trust me with their design work yeah. because I was so young and so I was like man it's like I can talk a mean talk over the telephone but once they meet me they're like how old are you and right so it was really difficult to get work that way so then I was like well, if I could show them my portfolio online, yeah. then maybe I could talk to them, I do see. it online, and then not have to meet them face to face. You've already sold them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so I started working on how do I build a website. And yeah. So I started teaching myself how to do that. And uh, my brother had his own business beforehand. And so I went and met with his uh, designer that was working on his website. And I was like, teach me how, to, how you built this website. And so just started learning, you know, again, on my yeah. own to figure out how do you do this stuff. And um, I remember and reading that you were making the websites, but then you saw the people you were making the websites for kept making money after you made the website. Yes. yes. And, and so were, you're yeah. like, I need to have my own website. I need to sell my own stuff. Right. That's right. And that's, that's right. when the, the Mexican vanilla comes in. Exactly. Tell me about your first experience trying to import the Mexican vanilla you had some issues yeah so uh, so with my parents being retired they moved down to Yuma Arizona right at the border and uh, so we went down to visit them and we'd cross over the border and they're selling you know all different kinds of fun little trinkets and stuff and we picked up this Mexican vanilla and I'm like I don't even know what this stuff is you know and my mom's like oh you gotta try it it's really good so we bring that across and you smell the stuff and it's like that is amazing. It right. doesn't smell like anything I've had synthetic here in the United States, you know. Actual, know. yeah. Yeah, I didn't know what the difference was, you know. But all of a sudden, after smelling it and tasting it, I was like, this makes a world of difference. And my wife, she can make some really good cookies. And every time she'd make them for people, they'd just go crazy over them. And so I was like, man, there's something to this vanilla. Does anybody sell this? And so, you know, did some... Google searches, or it was probably a Yahoo search back then, but, right, <laughs> but, right. but uh, did some searches and, and found out that nobody was selling it. And so I was like, well, gosh, I think I can figure this out. You know, I, I help all these companies build websites selling this stuff, so maybe I can figure it out. So I contacted the company that makes the vanilla. And um, and so they said, oh, yeah, we can't really export it into the United States. The FDA blocks us. So one of the things that they add to the vanilla to get the oil and the water to mix and stuff is the same ingredient we use in rat poisons. And it's a blood thinner. Oh, my God. In the United States. And so that's yeah. why they won't approve it. Yep. And then there's other other issues with, you know, bacteria and stuff that the FDA will randomly test and find in, in things that, you know, not purifying the water before they add the vanilla beans to it and that type of thing. Right. And so anyway, so there's a lot of a lot of reasons why they they wouldn't allow these companies to bring it in. So yeah. I contacted the FDA and I'm like, who do you allow to bring it in? They're like, yeah, we can't share that information with you. It's like, oh, so it took me. It, took it was me a good a try though. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that would be an easy way to go, but they don't, they don't give out that information. So anyways, uh, I, I just started beating the bushes till I found somebody and that we could import with. And so I mean, what did you do? you look, I mean, at that point, are you looking online to try and find these people? What do you do no, to... No, it wasn't even online. I Honestly, I can't remember. I can't remember the first time that I reached out to them or how I found them. Yeah. And so, anyway, so we, I, I found this family who was making it. And I, I think at the time, they weren't on any blacklist. And so we had to work to get them approved. We had to bring a shipment across and get it tested and all that right, type of right. stuff. And so then we just had to constantly be working to, to make sure that, you know, the process is clean and pure and that type of thing. And so, you know, I started with just a few cases, started bringing them in. 
and uh, and it started selling. In fact, I built the website under my wife's name, so her name was Cora. And so I was like, "Here, I'll build this website for you." So I created this CoraScreations.com, and so she she started selling the vanilla for us, you know. And uh, you know, it was a few hundred dollars the first month. And people and were like, just strictly buying it online. Yeah. At this point, and yep. then you'd ship it, and you just ship it out. Yeah. Yeah. And so what did you use to what was the did you build like an I mean, at that point, was there like an e-commerce platform that we we had built one for our website creation tool. And that was a really fascinating thing, too, is by using our own tool. All of a sudden it's like, well, I wish it could do this. Right. And I wish we could do that. And boy, I really need to do this. So we just started tweaking this thing and started making it better and better and better just so I could have it for my own you know, my own business, but it worked for everybody's platform at that point. And so it just kind of made, it, it just made sense all the way around to keep doing this. And, um, anyways, it got to where we were doing a couple thousand dollars every month. And I was like, okay, honey, it's time I took this over. <laughs> right. How were you getting so, the word out at the time? How um, were people finding it? Just, just through searches. Through searches. Yeah. Yeah, that was the only way, just doing pay-per-click advertising. And then we ended up getting the number one ranking on all the major search engines because that's what I would help companies do. And uh, so anyway, so we started doing really well with it. And so I was like, okay, it's time to bring this in-house, you know, and, and I'll take care of it because my wife, she's, she was raising three kids at the time. And then she also started to get uh, really depressed and not over the – the success of the business or the strain of the right. business, but she dealt with a lot of depression. And, you know, at that time, I didn't even know what it was. You know, when I got down and discouraged, my dad kicked me in the butt and I would get up and figure it out, you know, right, and right. that didn't work for her. Not that I kicked her in the butt, but uh, right. you know, trying to motivate her and get her up. And it was just awful. She was struggled with it, something fierce. And we went and met with tons of different doctors. Yeah, on the, on the story page, it said like, I don't know, like nine or 10 or 11, yeah. whatever different psychiatrists, psychologists working yes. through it. And you said nothing helped. Yeah, nothing was helping. She actually tried 28 different medications wow. and just had awful reactions to every single one of them. Just yeah something from her tongue turned gray and her wow. teeth started to turn gray overnight and she lost all of her energy it was like what is going on to to uh just almost delirious with some of the medications it was it was awful and and uh, so I'm just like, man, what is the answer to this? I remember going to some of the doctors going, I just want to see the wheel that you're spinning here and you're throwing the darts at to figure out what we're doing. Right, right. And uh, I, I was by no means a, a health nut or anything like that. That was the answer I was going for was through medication. And right. it wasn't, we couldn't find it that way. You know, we tried everything that we could. And so anyways, uh then I was on one of my trips to Mexico. I was introduced to agave nectar, and uh, they, the you know, agave for most people at that time was used in tequila, and that's how everybody knew it. You know, that the same plant is used that way, and uh, but if you stop it from fermenting, it's actually very sweet. And, uh, and so, but that was all we knew about it. They gave me some bottles when I was down there on my trip yeah. and, and I brought those bottles back and I was like, sure, I'll try and sell them. It was a friend of the family that we, uh, were selling the vanilla for. I gotcha. And so you're like here, try and sell this too type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. They're like here. And so this company happened to be in the honey business for many years and they, they had some relatives that were growing agave plants cause there was a shortage in the mid nineties. And so everybody started planting agave to to try and meet that demand yeah and so they had all these relatives with agave plants so they figured out all right we'll start making agave and uh, and then they're like here Brian you go ahead and try and sell it so I take back a couple cases and it's just slow going you know nobody is nobody's buying it nobody knows you know when you have Do when you you're put, like what's your process to launch it then so you put it on the website and then yeah. you email like what's the process yeah. to get the word out yeah, that was it. I mean, I think we had 2,000 subscribers at that time to our email list, yeah. you know, and, and we just sent off the email and we just posted it online and yeah. and we were going after natural sweeteners as keywords and stuff like that. 
and uh, and that was about. Did you do it. any paid advertising at the time, or is there what's the Just paid like, advertising landscape yeah, paid, look like at the time? Oh gosh, it was like five cents a click back then. Yeah. It was you know it didn't hardly cost anything. We had no competitors, and uh, and then I remember one time um, somebody from Trader Joe's called us, and at that time I was actually living in Virginia because that's where my wife's family was from, and we needed some extra help taking care of the kids and right. with my wife with her being so sick and so we were living in Virginia and at that time Trader Joe's didn't exist over there and so somebody called us and they're like tell us more about this agave and I'm like it's sweet it tastes good <laughs> Like, can we talk to someone else? No, I'm just <laughs> exactly. I'm like, hold on. Let me see if I can find somebody. Let me patch someone in from <laughs> change, Mexico. Who knows what yeah, change your voice. Hi. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, and so I, I talked to him for a bit about it. And they why said, were well, they calling you? Well, they they were interested to learn more about the product. Mm. They had found out about it, or or I don't know how they had found out about it, but they had heard about it and they were interested in a natural sweetener. And so I told them all of everything I knew about it, which was very little. And they said, you know what? It's just too niche. We don't think it's ever going to take off. I was like, oh, okay. There goes my chance of getting it into stores, you know? Really interesting though that Trader Joe's called you. Yeah. 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 And so then, uh, so then I had somebody else come to me and say, you know, in Washington, D.C., which is, you know, a couple hours away from where I was living, there was a facility there that would test the, your products with diabetics. And hmm. you should give them a call and see if it works well with diabetics. Interesting. Again, I was like, diabetics, what, what is that exactly? I mean, I've heard of it, but I didn't know what that was, you know, back in the early 90s or whatever. So yeah. I was just like, or no, it was... Yeah, late 90s, I guess. So anyway, so I, I was like, yeah, let's uh, I'll give it a shot. Let's I'll, I'll find out what what it entails. And so I went to this organization and I said, I'd like to test this product. And how much do you need? And and then how much does it cost? And I just went, oh, <laughs> I don't I don't know if I'll ever recoup my investment from the cost of this test. Like we haven't ever made that much on this product. We barely made that much with the vanilla, you know, and I'm just like, uh, what were they charging at the time? Um, I, you know, I think it was like 15 grand or something. So I mean, yeah. it was it wasn't a it's ton, like but... you're like, how many bottles of this stuff do I need to sell? <laughs> you know, like. <laughs> Yeah, serious. And it was just at the time. But you did, you did it. Business. But you did it. it. Just, yeah. So we. And so, so what I, made you decide I, to actually do it? I bar, well, I prayed about it to be honest, <laughs> and I was if it's like, the right decision. Yeah, I was just like, I gotta just, I gotta feel good about it, one way or another. Even, and I said, if it doesn't pass the test, do I get my money back? And they're like, Oh no, you don't get your money back. It's like crap. And so I had to make the decision. Once I spent the money, it was gone. And I would never see it again, you know. And so I was like, I'll take that chance. And I, you know, I prayed about it with my wife, and we were like, we feel good about it. We got to take the chance, or it's never going to do anything. Yeah. So, so we borrowed money from my website development business, and we we invested it into there. And we're like, all right, let's let's give it a shot. And so we took a chance. We tested it with them. And I remember the call that I received from the owner of the testing facility. And her first question was, tell me more about this agave. And I was like, well, huh, I don't know anything more. That's why I gave it to you guys, you know? I don't know. And they're like, well, how's it produced? So I went through that whole process and I was like, do you have test results? And she goes, yeah, and they're really good. Wow. And I was like, oh, okay. And so she explains, you know, the, the glycemic index, which I'd never even heard of before of a product and how that, the, that's the amount of sugar that your body absorbs yeah. from whatever you eat. And yeah. You re you have a really good display on your uh, website that people can click through. It's globalgoods.com backslash glycemic testing agave nectar. And you can see that that was probably from the test results. The yeah. volcanic agave nectar is 27 and yeah. then, you know, like a high fructose corn syrup is like almost 90. Right. Um, so it's a huge anything, difference there. 
Yeah, anything that's higher than 55 points can't be considered uh, good for diabetics. It just yeah. causes their blood sugar level to spike too high. Yeah. And then there was another test that they did called the glycemic load, and that's the total amount of sugar that your body absorbs, and that can't be higher than 10 points, and we were at 1.6. Wow. And so she's like, this stuff is amazing. This is yeah. really good. And, and so, it's not all, I mean, clarification in, you know, disclaimer there, it's not all agave because some agave add other things to it. And right. so there once we, is once corn we got syrup. That, once we got that certification, that approval saying it was diabetic friendly, all of a sudden that starts showing up on everybody's agave. And everybody's going, oh, this is low glycemic and, and this is uh, diabetic friendly and all this type of stuff. And it's like, whoa, whoa, hold on. Do you guys have testing for that? You know. And So we had to kind of start policing things from some right. competitors that started showing up. But even before the competitors started showing up, um, Oprah had her own show back in the day, and, and Dr. Oz was her guest doctor that she would bring on every so often. And somebody asked Dr. Oz, what, uh, what sweetener do you like to use? And he goes, I like to use agave nectar, and pulls out our bottle. Really, it was your bottle. Yeah. And so it was just like unbelievable. Wow. The sales went through the roof. We sold out in days. And uh, and then it just, you know, started rolling from there. And so we just started manufacturing more and more. And then six months later, when we finally got caught up, uh, Oprah did a rerun of her show and it just took off again. And so that kind of put us on the map. That started creating all the competitors at that point. And then people are going, OK, you know, it takes eight years to grow this agave plant to full maturity it costs a lot of money to manufacture it and so and then you have to start all over again with that process and so people started coming up with different I'll just adding call, different things yeah variations yeah. of agave yeah. and uh and you know because it's not it's, pure yeah so what's the difference right. between like a typical one that someone gets maybe the grocery store and yours so it's interesting, um, you know, when stuff is manufactured in Mexico and you bottle it here in the United States, you label it the way that you receive it. And so if they're telling you that it's 100% agave, you're required to put 100% agave on your label here in the United States. And so that's how a lot of manufacturers do it. Um, and so, but in Mexico, it's a little bit different. Business is kind of what you can get away with is how business is done. And it's not always that way, but for a good part of the business that I've seen around the world, it's that way in a lot of different areas. Whatever you can do to make more money for your own family, that's yeah. what you need to do. And uh, that's not what my business was based off of. That's not the kind of person that I am. And you know, going back to my wife being really sick, we started eating a lot healthier. We started researching, you know, okay, I mean, we were drinking drinking our sodas, doing, you know, whatever, eating our cake all the time, whatever it was, right. you know, doing all that. A lot that. of sugar, it's, processed sugars. Of, and, yes, exactly. Yeah. And so as I started to learn more about what diabetes was, my wife's mother uh, is a diabetic and starting to lose feeling in her feet and that type of thing. And yeah, so horrible, yeah. it was like, maybe we got to start paying attention to this a little bit more. So I started to teach myself how to make different things using the agave. And uh, so we started eliminating a lot of the sugar that we were eating. Yeah. And all of a sudden she starts turning around and she starts doing better. Really? Having energy, wow. feeling happier, all that kind of stuff. I wouldn't say it was all sunshine and roses, but it really was a significant change in her life that yeah. allowed her to do a lot more. And so I was like, man, there's something to this. And and then when I find out that the other companies, manufacturers, there's only three of us in, the, in Mexico that are making this stuff now. And um, the other two are are making it in a way that uh, isn't the healthiest way. <laughs> and so, and it's it's much cheaper and you can get it to go a lot further that way, but it's not the healthiest way. What are way. some things people add into it to make it go further, they, like they corn syrup? They hydrolyze sucrose into it. And also uh, you'll start finding maltose. Malt comes from corn. So it's possible that it's corn syrup and stuff like that. Right. In fact, I caught my own guy, so I, I skipped a step in there, but when I after that testing that we had done and found out that it was good for diabetics, I went and invested a lot more money into the facility in Mexico to get it up to manufacturing standards that we would like to see here in the right. United States. Right. 
And, um, and so I had some ownership with them through that process. Yeah. And so, I mean, you know, they still do things the way that they do them in Mexico, but I have a large say as to how this product comes out in the end. And one time I was just thinking, you know what? I should just keep these guys on their toes and I'm going to test this next shipment that comes across the border. Right. And so I stopped it. We have a warehouse in Laredo, Texas. And so I stopped it in Laredo and I had an independent lab come in and test it. And all of a sudden sucrose started showing up in our agave mm. and it had never been there before. And I was like, whoa, time out. <laughs> I'm like, what is, where'd that come from? And they said, oh, we're trying this new process down here that everybody's doing and it makes it so much cheaper. You'll be so much happier because we're going to make so much money off of it. And I was like, no, guys, we I use this stuff in my own home, you know, and right. my customers are buying this from me because it's good for diabetics and we can't be adding sucrose to it for a number of reasons, you know, and they were really upset with me. And I said, look, I will drop everything right now and I will stop selling it if that's how we're going to continue. Right. And so they were upset with me, but we stuck to it. And from that point on, I test every single batch that comes across the border. I'm great friends with the family. We, uh, you know, we know each other's children, you know, all, all kinds of stuff. We're really good friends, but at the same time, business is done differently in other parts of the world. You don't want to risk it. Yeah, with every product we bring in, I test everything once it hits the United States and I test How it. do you test it? You just open a random bottle or what happens? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and so that way, you know, they'll do their own testing in Mexico or in Africa or yeah. whatever, which is good cuz I don't want them sending something that they know is bad. But at the same time, you could have a separate bottle that's not matching the rest of the lot that is that's being shipped to me and so um, yeah we have an arrangement with some testing facilities and people that sample stuff right at the borders and then we can determine whether we bring it into shipping yeah so and that that has helped us a ton with manufacturers so like I was saying where we ship lots of drums and we ship lots of bulk items you know and totes and, and you ship the boats. smaller packages too though right we do yeah. we do but right now you know you've got the largest sugar manufacturer in the world who's now stepped into the agave realm and so they're selling bottles the cnh sugar domino sugar that organization oh yeah they now have their own agave brand in all the grocery stores and so it's like how can the heck could I ever compete with those guys and on the store shelves everybody says 100 percent agave but when you deal with manufacturers, when you they test, if you for, tested that stuff, it's probably yeah. Not. They look at all the test results of everybody's products because they're required to do that. And uh, when they see that ours doesn't have uh, or has the lowest amount of fructose, the lowest amount of glucose, there's no sucrose, no right. maltose, nothing like that. They're all like, "Well, why does this one have it and this one doesn't? Right. We'll go with the one that doesn't." Right, so right. We win that battle a lot of the time. So you in grocery stores too, or no? Uh, not many, not many to be honest. So we do most of our selling online. So it's called the volcanic blue agave. So why yeah. volcanic? Because the you know it's interesting. On one of my first trips down there, walking through these fields where the agave plants are growing, I tried to photograph it. Part of it was my limited ability with photographing and my camera, but the ground, the soil shimmered. It, it almost looked like there were shards of glass in the soil. And I tried to take a picture of it and it never really Didn't do it justice. Out. Yeah. And they said, yeah, this whole region is all volcanic soil and it's just high in nutrients mm. and the agave plants grow like crazy wow. here. So I decided to call it volcanic nectar. One reason was because before that I called it blue agave nectar and everybody started using that name because that's the type of plant. It was a blue agave plant. So everybody was using that name and then it was hard to differentiate between who was certified, who wasn't, that type of thing. Right. So I decided to trademark the name Volcanic Nectar and, and push it that way. So where else can people get it, Brian? So you can get it on globalgoods.com backslash agave nectar. Any other places online that people can buy it? Um, yeah, there's some, uh, some groups that are selling it on eBay and some that sell it on Amazon as well. So it's not you, but it's you maybe yep. selling it to someone and do other people buy it in those huge drums and rebottle it? Yeah, too? they do. They will. Yeah. Not many, but yeah, they do. So they'll, they can get it on Amazon, but I mean, it, to make sure it's yours because that may have a different label on it. 
right, right if it's on Amazon or eBay. Right. But yours is it can only be found pretty much on your site. Yeah. Um, we, we we don't allow the the certifications and stuff to be used on other brand labels just because we can't monitor. You just don't know. What's yeah. Going though, so. Yeah. Um, so, what, did the site crash when Doctor Oz mentioned it? I mean, <laughs> it did. How does it not? I mean, you're a web person, obviously, but that much well, traffic to a site. So my, uh, so I was living in Utah at the time, and my in-laws in Virginia said, "You've got to put on Oprah, and you gotta, you gotta watch this show because they, you're not gonna believe what happened." You know, so they told me what happened. So I immediately jumped on my website and wrote, "Thanks, Oprah," and put a coupon code up there. You know, receive ten percent off or whatever using the coupon code "Thanks, Oprah." And then I don't even know how I did it back in the day, but somehow I recorded the television show on my laptop. Yeah, where is it? Is it? I would think it'd be on your site somewhere. Can you find well, it? It was until I realized that was illegal. <laughs> so, I so see. The next day after their show, I had the video clip with Dr. Oz on there, you know, and I was promoting that like crazy. Then, and I put, you know, a, like a watermark at the bottom saying, you know. Uh, globalgoods.com or whatever it was and and uh, and then all of a sudden you'd start seeing the video showing up on other competitor sites and they would shrink the video so it would cut off my volcanic nectar thing at the bottom you know and and uh, yeah and, people are ruthless huh <laughs> yeah they are. they are and then uh, and then I started hearing about uh, Oprah's uh, attorneys going after some other people that were using her show to promote their products as well and I was like is that wrong? <laughs> I think I think I had done it for a year or so, you know. Yeah. And then I realized I was like, "That's wrong." Yeah. I was like, "Oh crap! I better pull that I off." I think in those cases, though, they specifically mentioned that particular company. Like in this case, Doctor Oz held up your yeah bottle, yeah. so it's a little different. I mean, I don't know if it's different. I'm just thinking, you know, then someone saying he said that this type of product is good, and they start right. using the video. Like he actually held up your product in yeah. the video, so I wonder, did you ever contact them to see can we actually, use? Actually, he it? ordered from us. So his wife, she was the one who would place orders from right. us, and so uh, we were actually in uh, communications with uh, Oprah's personal chef for a while. Yeah, and uh, he was making you know different different uh, meals for her and using yeah. our agave and stuff. They would take, we had these little squeeze packets and they would put those in the green room of her show so people could add it to their tea and stuff like yeah. that. And so, yeah, it was, we had a, a great relationship going for a while. I didn't even know he was ordering because but it was you under couldn't, his You name. still can't include the video. You, you still took it down. Yeah, we still took it down. Yeah. I was too I was too small to, to fight with anybody like yeah. that those things. Whether it was right or wrong, I decided to play it safe. So anyways, it uh it worked real well for us, kinda of put us on the map and, and then everybody started calling and, and it, it worked well. That's wild. So is that why you started making the squeezable agave packets? Like yeah. what what sparked that? Oh just I was you know, sitting in a restaurant and you start seeing the, the little sugar packets there or, uh, you know, sometimes they'll have honey and little packets. And so I started going through, OK, how do you make those type of things? And that was real tricky to, to figure that process out. We had a machine in Mexico where we were trying to do it. But the agave, every time the machine would shut off, there would be a tiny little like just a little drip of, you know, a stream of agave that wouldn't quite stop and the machine would seal, but it wouldn't be able to seal that one little spot. And so we bring them all in and they'd be leaking and just cause all kinds of problems. So we finally found a company in the United States that would do less than a million of those packets. You know, it's like, I don't want to produce a million if we're going to be holding on to them for 10 years. Right. You know? Right. And so anyways, we found somebody who would make a smaller run for us and, and started working that angle. But then, uh, you know, the, the industry itself took a hit several years ago where uh, some people on the Internet started saying bad things about agave. They're going, this stuff isn't any better for you than high fructose corn syrup. And it was difficult to argue with them because they found some agaves that had 90 percent fructose in it. Right. And ours is closer to like a 50 percent fructose, you know. And and uh, so anyways, there's all kinds of stuff that, you know, people were doing to the product, which was kind of messing it up for the entire industry. And uh, and so it took a hit. The online sales took a hit for a while and they're, you know, they bounced back, but 
the trajectory was going like this and then it just kind of went like this you know right. it's still goes up each year it's still one of our best selling products but uh, it's not progressing like it used to so Brian at the height of the Dr. Oz thing how many bottles do you think you sold oh man in a day like what was the the high for the day that that you remember honestly I don't remember that was like in 2005 I think and mm -hmm. I, I really don't remember uh, I just remember being out of stock before the day was over <laughs> really seriously yeah. wow. it, it just went that fast and so we were just how fast can we manufacture this stuff and, and you know and by the time we built up an inventory that was large enough they did the rerun and you know in that time we weren't I think we still went out of stock again but not until uh, or I mean it took us several days and there were weeks maybe and then it, you know we finally uh, were able to produce it at a much faster pace at that point. Well, wow. so go back to your wife's condition because you were starting to say that it was getting better. What yep. ended up happening? So, uh, well, we were living in Virginia at the time and she started getting better and better. And yeah. uh, she was also- And this was a, without drugs, right? Actually, no, at that time she was on Zoloft. Okay. And, and, and we were eating healthier, but she started doing better. Yeah. So then uh, we moved out to Utah and you know had to change health insurances. And we went in to get her prescription for 300 milligrams of Zoloft. And they said, uh, that's not possible. I'm like, what are you talking about? That's what she's been taking this whole time in Virginia. They're like, that's an unheard of dose. We're like, what? <laughs> and they, they said, yeah, there's, there's no research that supports that type of dose. We can't, we can't write a prescription for that amount. So I was freaking out. I was like, ah, I don't want to go backwards and where we were, you know. Yeah. And so I immediately booked a trip to Mexico and I bought the Mexican version of Zoloft. I bought like $500 worth, which is a ton down there. And I brought it back just going, I got to keep this keep this going, you know. But then I started thinking about it going, wait a minute. If, uh, if she shouldn't be on that level, is that healthy? You know, is that going to help right. us? So... Um, we've really started working on a lot of different things of, you know, eating a lot healthier at that point and, and, you know, teaching, we, we met a therapist guy who was just fantastic, who, who taught us how to, um, work through our issues mentally, basically, where he, uh, he had this thing called a thought record, which taught you how to take some of the thoughts that would bring you down and discourage you mm -hmm. and how to look at them in a different way you know, from a different perspective, basically. Mm. And uh, started teaching us just a lot of different ways. And like I say tools us, that you can use on your own. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then exercise. Exercise was a huge part of it, you know. And, and so eating healthy, exercise, sleeping better. Just we started working on all these things naturally. And all of a sudden she started kicking it. And, uh, and you know, it still hits her. There's days where she'll be down and just like, I, when she goes down, she could sleep the entire day and sleep the entire night. And so there's days when that still happens, but uh, you know, she, she just stays with it. And you know, there's times where, hey, we go on vacation and we eat terrible, you know, or we do whatever. Yeah. And, and then we come back and there's, undoubtedly, there's usually a crash after that. Right. You know? And so, uh, but then after that, we get back into our routine again and we try and yeah. eat healthy. And, and then I started noticing it with our children where, um, you know, they, they're great kids. Yeah. And, you have three kids, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so they're great kids, but then, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll slack off with them or, or they'll go to somebody's birthday party yeah. and pound a ton of Pizza, cake. Up. Oh yeah. Cake. Just, yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. You name it. They they pound it like they've never had it before, you know. And, <laughs> and then they uh, then they come home and they're just bouncing off the walls. And then they hit their crash period. And yeah. and so you know, at that point, I'm looking at my wife's old Zoloft bottles, going, "I'm going to start popping those myself," you know. Right, <laughs> right. Trying to hold this whole family together yeah. sometimes. <laughs> and all the businesses. Yeah. Yeah. So we talked about the Mexican vanilla. <clears throat> Yeah. What's the most popular size that people buy? The and by the way, I have to say something about the Mexican vanilla because, and I didn't, I didn't put this together. You're a graphic designer, but the design is beautiful on yeah. the on the packaging. You know, globalgoods.com Mexican or backslash Mexican vanilla. Um, it's it's amazing. It looks like a tequila bottle, essentially. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's it's tell me hand- about coming up with the design because that's it's a hand blown glass bottle. And wow. so uh, they use a lot of those type of bottles when making tequila uh, down in Mexico. And you know what's funny is uh, I'm a, a Mormon, and so I don't drink alcohol. And uh, so it's kind of funny every time I go down there, they're like, "Hey, you got to try this." I'm like, "No, guys, I don't do that." <laughs> and so uh, they, they always get me in some type of situation where they're trying to get me to. But uh, anyways, uh, it's more of a comic thing that we go it's through. a beautiful looking bottle and label yeah, they, yeah. They, use, they use a lot of those a lot of those designs when uh doing the real fancy tequilas and so i was like well why don't we do that with uh, the mexican manila yeah and so we we started bottling in that packaging and uh lots of lots of boutique stores and stuff like to pick that up and yeah they they that sells really well for them What's the most popular size? Because you have the 240 milliliter, one liter, because I know it's a conscious decision because every size you include, you have to spend money on the packaging and the labeling and everything. So it's not a decision I'm sure you take lightly. Right. Um, um, Surprisingly, the the size that sells by far the most is the one liter bottle. One liter. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering in our cabinet, like... I'm wondering why the label looks familiar. I'm wondering if we actually have this in our cabinet. <laughs> well, um, if not, if not, send me your address. Yeah, we'll get you a bottle. <laughs> we'll, we'll be getting some agave, yeah, um, for sure. So the one liter yep. tells the most. And yep. so we talked about the Mexican vanilla, the agave, um, and the agave. So what's the most popular size for, for that one? Because you have the smaller bottles, you have the one gallon, you have the five gallon, and then you have the huge drum of right. the agave well yeah with with uh the, agave, and the squeezable ones too yeah with the agave and the coconut oil we sell more drums than anything else really yeah wow yeah and then uh but with the smaller bottles it's the 24 ounce agave bottle we sell a lot of those and then uh with the coconut oil gosh it's it's a toss-up between the 28 ounce bottle and the one gallon What's your favorite recipe? I know you have a recipe book, uh, you know, the cooking yeah. with agave. What's your favorite personal recipe that people can think about using agave nectar? Cheesecake. Cheesecake? Yeah. So yeah. in replace of just sugar or what do sugar. people use? Sugar. Yeah, in replace of sugar. You can also use uh, coconut oil in the cheesecake. You can use Mexican vanilla in there. So there, yeah. you get all free products into one ingredient. Yeah, I'm going to get this because I make my own ice cream and uh-huh. non-dairy, you know, with yeah. coconut milk. And yeah. the agave um, would be perfect for that. And probably the Mexican vanilla too. Yeah. So, yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's surprising how many times you can use all three in the same time. Yeah. And the coconut oil. Um, and we talked about, so let, let's talk about the, anything else to, to mention with the coconut. We talked about the story of that and the, the, the cacave we haven't talked that much about. I mean, we talked a little bit about you forming it. Um, what were you able to do so it didn't emulsify? Um, well, I just, just learning how to, the different emulsifiers out there and how they, how they work and, and combining those type of things. Then it's just basically measurements after that, how, you know, how much agave bef- before the, the lotion starts feeling sticky, you know, you don't want yeah. that feeling on it. And, and, uh, so anyways, it was just a balance in our, our kitchen. We just destroyed our kitchen for a couple of months, basically, <laughs> where we were just mixing and trying different samples and then things would get moldy and we're like, oh, okay. So what are some natural things that you can use to, you know, prohibit the mold and that type of thing? And so we try different formulas and, and just finally came up with a formula that worked that was all natural. And, uh, and then we had to find somebody who could manufacture it for us. Uh, was that hard to do? No, to find it wasn't someone? actually. No. And uh, it took us, I mean, it took us a while to find the, the right group that would do small runs because I didn't want to do another 100,000 bottle lotion <laughs> run because it was like, I don't know if it's even going to sell. I didn't know if it would even work then. So right. we found somebody to take a chance and they just did, uh, I think it was 5,000 bottles for us. And so that was the smallest run that they would only let us do once. And so I was like, all right, let's hope it works. And right. it started off a little bit slower because it wasn't our normal food product line but then as we started introducing it to all the massage therapists and cosmetologists yeah. and stuff it really started to take off at that point 
So when do you, because again, it's more time, energy, resources, money to expand the product line. You right. have the lotion. So at what point do you, what was the next product on the Kakabe? Uh, then we created the shampoo and conditioner. Okay. Why that and, one next? Um, just because of the, the cosmetologists and beauticians that they I were worked asking about in the it. other industry. So yeah, they were like, you know, and it was, well, and because, you know, people have problems with their hair, not just dandruff and stuff but with their scalp and you know we we started a formula and the very first one I created really wasn't that good um, my wife didn't want me to sell it <laughs> she's like it's not that good and I'm like but it's natural and people will like that <laughs> and so I launched it and you know some people came back and said this is fantastic other people said it's not my favorite especially when it came down to the conditioner and so we reformulated both the shampoo and conditioner after I learned some things it was fascinating because people are like uh, you know some of the customer base that we had would give us suggestions well you should try this instead of that and you should do this instead of that like so for ingredients or what were yeah, they saying really yeah with ingredients yeah and so I was like all right I'll give it a shot I don't know why you know or, or i would research the ingredient and figure out why they would suggest that right. so i went back to the drawing board and kind of reformulated it and loved it my wife loved it and uh you know now we get people that are just they can't live without it <laughs> and so that's a good following to start building that's amazing so each new product line i mean obviously in the beginning the mexican vanilla was started from from scratch because you didn't have any customers but then right. each one you introduce the agave nectar you get more customers yeah. and obviously the dr oz was right. a huge thing and then the coconut oil same thing you kind of introduce it to your current customer base beyond the current customer base what else do you do to get the word out for people who have their own e-commerce company what you know what else has worked for you well, uh, in all honesty, we have uh, over 65,000 websites that we've built through the massage therapists, cosmetologists, wow. estheticians wow. Really? through that group. Yeah. And now um, the vast majority of those websites now have the products selling on their website. Wow. So we, we take care of the credit card processing, the shipping, the everything for those people. And we just took their websites from just being a regular phone book. So page they actually, actually can make money. Yeah, so they can start making money with it. We take care of all that for them. And then we gave them the ability to print their own labels to put on the bottles. Uh, we created a, a mixing wand where you could mix in your own ingredients to customize it for your customer base and all kinds of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's really starting to grow. And we just... That's just, wild. Two months ago, I just built the website IWantASpa.com. Okay. And so you can find a professional in your area. Some people stock the cacave in, on their shelves uh, other people just have it on their websites but uh, that's a good place to go if you want to find a professional in your area so do you still have to manage the back end of the people are still running the sites from the original one that you created right yeah yeah so you still have that business yeah still it's still going so is there a lot of updating you have to do there or is it pretty much self self-sufficient it's, it's just kind of running itself right wow. now Sixty-five thousand websites that's amazing yeah that's crazy so the next one was the shampoo and conditioner for the the kakave um yeah. what was the next one after that uh then it was the different essential oil type blends and so we started yeah. making things that would work really well for eczema and you can yeah. mix that in with the yeah. lotion what got you into the essential oils um, we have some essential oil companies here in Utah that are some of the largest in the world, really? and uh, and they they charge out the nose for their oils. It's expensive. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And so you know, I met some of the manufacturers of these oils throughout my travels, and it's not really that expensive but when they do it in the using the model that they're using which is kind of a multi-level marketing yeah model, a lot of them exactly uh, yeah. then they have to mark it up to cover everybody in the downlines and I'm not a real fan of that marketing style myself and so um, especially dealing with the professionals you know I, I give them a percentage of the sales that they sell from their website but I don't do several tiers of that you know yeah. and so by not doing that we can beat everybody on those prices and they actually buy some of those oils from us <laughs> oh really yeah so I've negotiated with the manufacturers of some of these places and they buy the oils from us and so 
anyways, uh, so it's it's kind of fascinating. That's the only way I'll I'll work with multi level marketing companies is if I'm supplying them the products. Right. <laughs> you know why. it's quality also. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways. what's your favorite? What's the most popular um, essential oil? You know, we've got the eczema blend. That's something that nobody else has. Yeah. What's it's in got, that? Um, I'm looking for that right now. Um, it's it's got some interesting things like horseradish in it. <laughs> really? Yeah. So just in doing some research and finding natural ways of, of things that people have used, periwinkle and stuff like that. Oh yeah, I see that. The cacave eczema relief is that. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's really fascinating some of the different uh, oils and plants and stuff that you can mix together that people have found have worked in all these other countries that we visit. Yeah. And I've been to Thailand, and they introduced me to a lot of these types of oils where, oh, yeah, they, they use this stuff naturally all the time. So, Brian, if you were to go back to yourself you know, over five, ten years ago, what would you have told yourself to avoid? Like what mistakes or, or things? Man, I, I always tell my wife, I'm not sure I would do it again. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, there was so much stress when uh, – you know, the stuff in Africa came in and that was, you know, a real expensive shipment that, you know, was bad oil. And we, you know, we ended up finding a source for it. Um, one time the FDA tested our agave nectar and found pesticides in it that we weren't using. And we found out that they were spraying a lake where we were pulling the water from to water our fields. They were spraying a lake for mosquitoes and that type of thing. And then we were all pulling our water from that lake, everybody does, to to spray their plants and that, that got into our agave. And so it kind of messed us up and put us on the blacklist with the FDA wow. for like six shipments or so. And that was an absolute nightmare that slowed everything down, you know? And so then we just kept, and then you had the, the sugar uh, where they mixed in the sugar with our... So where do you even get the water at that point? I mean, well, it's like they're still, getting the water from the lake. Yeah. It's not like you, you can still, make a new lake. I mean, right. No, you can still use the water. You just have to uh, filter the water oh, before it gets I put gotcha. on plants. And so, it's an extra step, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we had to invest in that. And, and you know, honestly, uh, we had the agave and the coconut oil. Well, it was before coconut oil. So we had the agave certified organic and we started our own bottling process uh, here in Utah just to make sure that the standards were what we wanted them to be. Yeah. And so we were putting the organic logo on our label. And then we found out that, oh, we have to have our facility organic certified <laughs> when we were doing the bottling. So it's like we made tons of mistakes, not on purpose, you know, but yeah. as we learned about it, it was like, oh, quick, yeah. we got to invest this and we got to do this and we got to test for that and right. whatever it was. And so it's just been a, a, you know, one learning process after another. And, you know, if I were to start it all over again, it would be such an impossible task because of all the stuff I know now. I would never be able to start it from the very beginning and, and do everything correctly, I guess, is the way you would say it. But because I didn't know, I just kind of started it, you know, and I used the Oprah video or I used, you know, right. what it was and I used the organic logo when I shouldn't have or whatever you know and, and uh, so anyways it was just it was just a learning process as you go and it, it's that way with every business. It's amazing. it's amazing what you've done and so you know you're all a web guy technical at heart what kind of software and tools you use to manage the business um, well we built all of our own e-commerce tools yeah. and, and so um, yeah so we there isn't real much I could uh, promote with that other than our own tool but uh the um uh let's see yeah so someone goes on your site obviously you built the site and then someone goes to the shopping cart you built the shopping cart okay. and then you go i guess you use um like a fulfillment center or whatever to ship out the yeah. product um anything used to manage like the statistics on the back end or do you do you actually have that built into your your website and things like that? Uh, no, we uh, with one of our newer sites that I've created, the I Want to Spa one. We're just using Google Analytics. Yeah. They they're doing a pretty good job right now uh, with the information that they provide. So we've yeah. just been using them. I'm wondering what's the 
uh, your take on not selling it on other other sites like Amazon or eBay where other people are maybe taking your product and selling it. What's right. this, what's your take on that? You know, I I I toss that one back and forth all the time. Yeah. And, and you know, I've got somebody in my office who's researching it now and just yeah. going. Maybe maybe that's a route that we need to go just because so many people are getting used to buying stuff off of Amazon. Yeah. Um, we have really good rankings on search engines. If you go to Google and search Mexican Manila, for example, we'll be in the top one, two, or three spots just yeah. depending that's on the Yeah, that's amazing, day. yeah. And so um, anyway, so we, we get a lot of traffic that way. And uh, and so and that's always been my, yeah. my pride and joy because I, I know that stuff well. You yeah. know, I've always handled that well. And, uh, but you know, it's, things are changing. So it's, it's a thought. It's like, yeah. it's a conversation that you're having with you and your staff and things like yep. that. Um, because I, I just, I mean, obviously when I was doing research, I looked it up and I would think you would guys would do amazing on some of those platforms like Amazon. Yeah. You know? Because yeah. people are on Amazon, but I, I didn't know if there was like a certain reason why, or like maybe you just sell in huge drums and you're like, I, no one's going to buy a drum on Amazon or something. Yeah, no, they, they won't be buying <laughs> but, you do have like a smaller bottles that you offer that people right. can buy too. And honestly, we we use uh you know my kids and a few other kids uh, from you know their friends and stuff that uh, do a lot of the shipping for us. Yeah. And so I keep that that part of the business around because it's a great experience for them. And uh, like my daughter just applied for another job and she was a shipping manager for Global Goods at one point. <laughs> you know, just it sounds official. Put, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, anyways, it's just good experience. It's a multinational them. company, Global Goods. <laughs> yeah, it right. is. It really is. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, anyways, it's, it's just kind of fun, but it gives them something to do. And, uh, you know, we have other employees as well, but it, it's just a good experience for them. Yeah. And it's not, a, it's not a huge money maker for us anymore. It used to be everything, but uh, it isn't so much anymore. So... Brian, first of all, I appreciate your time. This has been unbelievable. Um, thank you for sharing the stories. Um, yeah. They're really, really amazing. Um, I have a few more questions. Before I ask them, um, where can we point people towards? I mean, I obviously talked about you know globalgoods.com. Um, any other websites that they should check out? Check out the iwantaspa.com. Iwantaspa.com. Yep. Find a professional in your area and give them some business. Yeah. Get a, get a massage, get your hair done, yeah. whatever. <laughs> so I always ask, um, you know, since the e-commerce mastery series and Inspired Insider, um, what's been the lowest business moment and how you push through and then the proudest? What's been the lowest? I would say uh, that that bad shipment of the coconut oil was a was a real tough one to, to overcome. Um, that one was. Why that was, is that? Because it seems like you handled it pretty well, and you found. I didn't someone. tell you how much time it took to handle it. Oh. Really, <laughs> it just felt like. I mean, I was sitting there looking, calling the dump, trying to find out how much it would cost to dispose of eighty drums of oil at the local dump. You know, and I wasn't quite sure how we were going to get through that. That was an expensive mistake, and uh, and then it was. It felt like I couldn't trust the guys in Africa anymore because you know if I bring in another eighty drums like that. Then we're toast you know and so it was just those those expensive mistakes when you're first starting off with things where we invested a lot of money to get to that point and then to have it kind of blow up on us that was that was a low point for us and uh and that was i mean it ended up turning around and it was really good yeah. how long it's, did it take for you to actually then figure out okay we could sell it to this lotion company and they're going to use it it was several months it was yeah and uh you know, the thing is, is as you get older or, or as I'm in the business longer, when bad things happen, it doesn't freak me out nearly as much as right. it used to. Yeah. Because you look back and you just go, I could have died so many times already, you know, or the business could have been pushed under so many times already that this is just a blip in the radar and we'll just right. keep on going. We'll figure it out. Yeah. And so now I've got guys, you know, that are new to the business that they see a problem and they're like, Oh, this is they're the worst They're freaking ever. out. Yeah. Like, ah, we'll get through it. It's no big deal. And you know, two weeks later it's fine and everybody's breathing again and whatever else. What's know? something lately that someone, 
because there's always fires to be put out, right? What's yeah. something lately that someone freaked out about that you is just a blip to you now because you've dealt with so much? Yeah, um, we we just launched that I want a spa program, you know, and uh, the way that we had configured everything really limited the amount of people that we could uh, build websites for. So I, I revamped the entire system because when I built the first system, that was before mobile devices and everything else was around, you know, and so we had to redo everything. We couldn't you know, put a Band-Aid on that old system anymore. Right. And so we, we started to work on, all right, how do we transition the 65,000 people over to the new system? And then as we got to about 15,000 people transitioning over, all of a sudden we started seeing problems with the database. And we're like, oh, crap, we built this wrong after all these years. <laughs> and so I was like, we got to tweak this. We got to do it differently. Yeah. We got to make some changes to it. And so that was just a few months ago. So... <laughs> So proudest moment when it's one of the proudest moments, business wise for you. Uh, you know, launching that Kakabe line, because uh, before that, I mean that in terms of a product aspect, that was one of the proudest moments. There, there's been many, but uh, you know, I always wanted to create something that no one's ever created before. Yeah. You know, like agave. Anybody with enough money can go and create agave. Coconut oil. You can bring in coconut oil. Mexican vanilla. Same type of thing. I wanted to create something that no one's created before, and so I was really, really proud of that product, and even more proud of how it's helping people versus uh, just creating a product yeah. you know and so I really like that um, but then on a personal level I really love helping people yeah and uh, you know we when last time or two times ago when we were in the Dominican Republic working on essential oils yeah. we, uh, we came across a family who two days before we arrived in the DR their home had burned down Jeez. And, their home is, you know, probably the size of your office that you're sitting in. I've I've there. been to Dominican Republic, and you know, there's for me the perception was there's hotels, and then there's really like small tin huts. I mean, I didn't see anything in between when we were traveling around. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, that's exactly it. And so, um, you know, we were able to help build a new home for that family. Mm. And, uh, you know, we've helped work on other projects and homes there and uh, built a uh, internet cafe and that kind of thing. And so we're doing some different projects there now. And yeah. that's just becoming really fun. Yes. Yeah. Seeing, seeing that you're able to help people that yeah. had nothing before, um, I found that that drives me and motivates me more than all the product stuff. Those sure. are just means to an end. Yeah. You know, talk about that because you've built those things. Um, but what you're creating in these places is really sustainability for them. Yeah. What's one of those stories where you remember, you know, because of, you know, they're getting coconuts and bringing it to, to you and you're paying them for it or you've created all these jobs. What's one of those stories that touched you because of all the jobs you're creating? You know, the uh, being able to have kids go to schools. Yeah. I mean, I can tell you a number of stories where, you know, the you see the tears in the, the mother's eyes as their child is the very first child that gets to go to school. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and girls that are being able to go to schools in places where they never had an opportunity to before. Yeah. Um, you know, in some, some of the schools that we help, like in the Dominican Republic, a little girl has a deformed arm. And, you know, and just seeing her having school clothes to wear, being able to participate with all the other kids and, and just, uh, you know, just and, and having my children go and interact with them. That's amazing. I'm sure yeah. that they've oh. seen so much. Yeah. You know, and we, we do some amazing fun things as a family when we go on these trips. We'll, we'll ride elephants. We'll pet tigers. We'll swim with sharks. You know, we've done some just amazing yeah. things. Most most yeah, people, one of the pictures you're holding a baby tiger, like yeah. feeding it. I'm like, if it's a tiger, I'm not sure if I'm holding it. <laughs> <laughs> if you look I, at the, the milk bottle on that one, the milk was almost gone, and I was just going, take the picture quick, because <laughs> I don't want to know what he's going to do when he's out of milk. For me, tigers are like it's unnatural for me to be in a picture in that close proximity to a tiger. I don't care how domesticated they are. Yeah. 
but the but the fascinating thing after each one of these trips i asked my children what was your favorite thing that we did on this trip yeah. and you know and i just doing some of those fun things that i listed there every time they say it was helping the kids in this one particular village yeah. one one village where we have a basketball court and we go and we play with these kids and play basketball with them you know and and uh, it's just so much fun. We just have so much fun and interacting and helping people. And, uh, and then, you know, giving my children that experience and having them appreciate it so that when we're at home and they've got the nicer things at home, they don't, you know, they, they appreciate, appreciate those things it. more. Yeah. yeah. And, right. and sometimes, and, you know, I'll be honest, sometimes we got to remind them. It's like, you know, what would a kid in Africa say to the, having to eat their vegetables, you know, <laughs> whatever it is. And they're like, I know, Dad, I know. <laughs> and the thing is, they've experienced that firsthand, so they do know. You're right. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's amazing. My, my son is uh, soon going to try to work on his Eagle Scout Award. And so he's going, Dad, what's a project I can do in another country for his big Eagle Scout project? And so he wants to take something on himself and wants to start doing something. And so I'll be curious to see what he comes up with. But those are the types of things that I want them to learn. Yeah. And, you know, they're not afraid of race. You know, they've seen Mexican kids. They've seen uh, black kids in Africa or, in, you know, Haitian kids or Dominican Republic kids. They've seen them all and they're not scared of them. And seeing them swing on the same swing together of a swing set that was built, you know, just... It's awesome. I love that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, you know, for you, I, what's in the pipeline? What's for nations expanding? Uh, <laughs> is there anything in the pipeline you can share as far as nations that you're looking into setting up or products? Like what's next for you? So Obviously, Dominic you're, you're always thinking, you're always producing yeah, stuff. Yeah. So I'm I, you know, we could have done this call at uh, four in the morning because I was up and my brain just starts kicking in and I can't sleep, you know, but I'm um, just always thinking about the next thing. Um, you know, I just barely got the I want a spa system up and running. And yeah. so now it's OK. Let's spend a little bit more time. The Dominican Republic is the new newest country yeah. that started working yeah. in. So, so what are they doing there? Uh, working on orange oil okay. and, and uh, lemon oil. And then we're working with another group that wants to start uh, importing uh, cocoa beans. They have uh, cocoa nibs that they have there and mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so we're we're looking into that as well and seeing if that's something that we want to do. And so that's going to take a few more trips to to finalize something there. But, but uh, that that's the the big one on the horizon right now. Is that typical for you, Brian? Do you usually wake up at four? What's it? What's your yeah. daily? What's your daily routine look like? It just depends. I mean, but yeah, sometimes that happens, and I, I just can't stop the the thought process. And I mean, I've got several notes, and I keep my phone next to my bed, which is probably dangerous. But it's like I'll wake up in the middle of the night and go, "Has anybody done that before?" And I'll just start searching for it, you know. And then I'll start making notes, and then I'll fall back asleep. Then I wake up like a truck rolled me over, you know. <laughs> so I can't can't maintain that lifestyle like I used to, you know. But uh, um, but yeah, I, I, I get up pretty early. Um, I actually coach my son's ultimate Frisbee team and, uh, every Monday, Wednesday and Friday, I put in about three hours in the morning of working with his team. Really? In and, the morning? Yeah. In the morning. What time does it start? Uh, we start at seven. Okay. So yeah, I miss a little bit of work doing that. So that's another reason I'll wake up at four so I can start working with some of the other countries where, you know, they're, they're awake during those times. Then I'll go to practice then I'll come home and get back into work and, and start going there. Yeah. But, you know, I got to give him props. Uh, his team won the state championship. Wow. This year. Congratulations. We'll take it. <laughs> How old is he? He's uh 14. Okay. Wow. That's <laughs> so, amazing. Yeah. So what lesson should we leave people with? We talked a lot about different really um, in the trenches stories. Um, yeah, the, the thing that uh, you just you got to find what you're passionate about and, you know, and the passions change and that's OK. You know, my when we first started our business, my passion was all about making money. I mean, it had to be, you know, we had to get it off the ground. And then when we had enough to to meet our needs, then it was like, well, what more can we do? And so we started to help with projects in Africa or wherever. And and then it was, 
that was really fun. Maybe that's where the passion needs to be. That's, that's a reason for getting out of bed in the morning. So we would mm-hmm. focus on that, you know, and put everything that we have into that. Um, you know, my wife, she's awesome. She's as patient as patient can be. She knows when uh, I get my mind set on something just to kind of let it do it, run its course. <laughs> sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, you know, but uh, I always, I take the baseball bat and I go after it. You know? <laughs> and, that's true. And I, and I figure it out. Yeah. Brian, thank you so much. Everyone should check out globalgoods.com. It's been great. Appreciate it, Jeremy.